Hello, I'm Katie Philbeam and this is Venture Capital. This week we talk sanctions. I go on a field trip and Tim Kirby takes us for a spin. So, despite peace talks between the conflicting sides in Ukraine, the EU is still considering more sanctions against Russia. These new measures will target state-owned Russian defense and energy companies, sales of military equipment, and tighter restrictions on bank lending. Right now, I'm joined by John Butler, CEO of Amphora Capital, who's joining us from London today. Right, John, so it seems like we have a ceasefire at the moment in terms of the tensions, but sanctions are still being considered by the EU. Uh, what potential could they have? Well, it really depends how far this escalates. And what you've seen so far is really pretty minor if you take a look at the areas that have been targeted relative to the overall size of the Russian economy or with respect to the retaliatory sanctions that Russia has placed on you know, various EU uh, economies, NATO members, so on and so forth. Up to now, what's happened is, again, really quite minor. So we're going to have to get you know, material escalation to really start to be able to talk about serious economic damage. That said, the interesting angle here is the political angle. You know, there's a political dimension to economic sanctions. And when Putin, for example, decided to retaliate with agricultural sanctions, sanctions on, on produce from Europe, um, politically, that's actually quite interesting because that's a very organized political group in the EU, which has already raised quite a fuss at the national level and to some extent at the EU level. So watch the political dimension uh, rather than just the economic dimension around sanctions from here. Mm -hmm. And what sanction would cause the most damage? What sector of the economy could be most at risk? I think everybody would agree that if NATO, the EU, and other associated uh, countries were to specifically target the natural resources industries of Russia, that that would be a truly dramatic, uh, some people would say almost potentially cataclysmic uh, economic move, given how dependent the EU is on Russian energy and raw materials, and naturally how dependent Russia is on the revenue of those exports. Uh, that's really where things are truly getting serious. And to be honest, I mean, I don't, I don't use this word lightly, but if you get into across-the-board sanctions on these fundamentally most important strategic Russian industries, it's a sign that this entire conflict is not going to be easily resolved and that people are really digging their heels in for something you know, tr potentially truly, truly um, prolonged and protracted. Mm -hmm. And John, it seems like because of the risk that you talk about in that particular sector, that the EU has been cleverly picking and choosing the sanctions that they're prepared to implement. They're not prepared to go the full way and go into the en energy industry, it seems. No, indeed not. And if you're looking at this from Russia's perspective, of course, this is simply confirmation that the EU's objectives with respect to the issues in East Ukraine uh, are limited. Uh, and, and that's true probably of the United States for that matter. You know, is it, is it truly a fundamental strategic interest to EU, NATO, US um, to get their full set of demands met? Uh, around the disputes in East Ukraine. Um, so uh, clearly, the EU is trying to appear serious. NATO is trying to appear serious, and they're trying not to lose face politically. Um, but certainly, so far, if you look at the way the sanctions battle uh, has developed on both sides, uh, certainly Putin and his advisors must sense that there is a, a lack of true, true deep, consistent seriousness uh, in these other countries with respect to these issues. And talking about not wanting to lose face, we've had the British Prime Minister David Cameron saying that sanctions would permanently damage the Russian economy. Is that possible? I, I hate to say this, but I, I think that's simply nonsense. Um, in fact, you could actually make the case 
that sanctions would almost, in some ways, around the margins, help the Russian economy to modernize and diversify, because they would simply have to become more independent vis-a-vis -vis many of their most important trading partners. Now, I'm not suggesting that trade protection, protectionism or sanctions are a good thing. No, they're a bad thing, and they do harm economies, certainly in the short term. But they also harm economies on both sides. It takes two to trade. It takes two to finance. There's two sides to all transactions, uh, be they financial or in real goods and services. And the idea that somehow you can do permanent damage to one side and do essentially no damage to another, it, it's just nonsense. It doesn't make sense. And anyone who studies these issues and understands these issues will know that Cameron is talking politics. He's not being you know, really serious with that comment. John Butler, thank you. Talking to us from London today, we appreciate your thoughts on the matter. The European Commission has said that Russia's food ban could cost the EU 5 billion euros. Now, to help out European farmers, the EU plans to allocate a further 30 million euros. That's on top of the 160 million to compensate firms in the industry. But most European farmers agree that's simply not enough. Meanwhile, for farmers in Russia, there is an opportunity to fill this gap. And I went along on a field trip to find out more about it. And here I am with the cows on a field in the outskirts of Moscow. And that's because agriculture companies here in Russia have surged in value by up to 40% so far this year. Now, the day after the Russian government enforced the food ban, well, they increased in value. And that's because savvy investors want to tap into the fact that these companies, these farming produce companies, will no longer have so much competition from international heavyweight brands, especially the EU. If we take, for instance, the EU, we're exporting around $7.5 billion worth of food to Russia. A third of that was actually dairy. Now, that leaves a huge gap in the market. So, yes, there is an opportunity for Russian farmers, but there's also a lot of pressure as well because they have to fill this gap. And there's also a concern that consumers will be expected to pay more at the cash point. Now, as well as that, for European farmers, we know that there's plenty of rotting produce now being left at the border. OK, now we're going to speak to a cheese farmer here, an American chef that came to Moscow to produce cheese. So let's actually see if he's in, Mr Jay Close, and we'll have a bit of a chat with him. Jay, hi. Good Привет. to see you. Hey, hi. You? Привет. Good, thank you. English, we We're going to do some English, if that's OK. OK. Yeah, wonderful. better for me. So let's go and have a stroll and talk okay. about cheese and dairy and all things agriculture. You sure. are in agriculture. And what is the situation at the moment? Because is it perhaps a huge advantage for people like you? Because there's a big it's gap a in the market. It's a huge advantage, but where there's advantage, there's also other farmers in in Ireland, in uh, in England, and uh, other countries in Europe, mm. that are like bankrupt. You know, they, they're sitting on so much produce, they don't know what to do with uh, too much cheese. They gotta lower their prices or find a new market. They were already organized in Russia, and mm -hmm. now, like, it's like me. I have my people, and let's say tomorrow I don't have my people. What yeah. do I do with all this cheese I prepared? Yeah. You but know, that's an advantage for you, though, isn't I'd it? I'd love because... that, but I don't like other people getting hurt over it. Right. I want people to buy my cheese because they like it, not because it's the only one available. Yes, yeah, so it's bad for the market well, as a whole. Bad for a market as a whole, yeah, I would say that. So Russia obviously doesn't have a problem with the amount of farming food that there is, so you don't think that there'll be a shortage? Well, I think there will be a yeah. shortage because Russia is not prepared to feed itself. Right. They've been too long buying from other countries depending on other people's produce they're going to have to get organized people who used to european standard uh, when there was a uh, soviet standard mm -hmm. it was kept at a, a reasonable level everything mm -hmm. was like government control and that broke down or closed up and everything just went terrible and then uh, in the last 15 years things started picking up i'm not saying that farmers are making money but they're picking up. Farmers are having a little bit more money to invest and, and see new technology and stuff that makes it easier to work with these animals. Jay, how are the sanctions against the European farmers going to affect the Russian farmer? There are going to be uh, more demands for uh, domestic Russian products and uh, 
the Russian uh, government is pushing people to buy more locally, and uh, I think it's just a, a great opportunity for Russian farmers. All right, Jay Close, thanks ever so much for talking to me today. Thank you to your cows as well. Belladonna, Blackie. For having us, yay, thank Paranoia. you. Paranoia, Friday. There they are, they've all got their own names, so thank you so much indeed. Here, at a Moscow farm. We're going to make cheese, you want to watch? Yeah, come on, let's go. Let's dive into corporate news now then. So state-owned Rosneft could sack up to 25% of their employees at their headquarters. Russia's oil major is suffering from declining output from mature Siberian fields. Production in August dropped to its lowest level since March 2013. Gazprom's natural gas production fell by nearly a fifth last month. Increasing Russian competition and declining exports are taking their toll. And Russia's largest social network, Contact T, could soon belong fully to Russia's richest man. Alisa Yuzmanov's company, Mal.ru, is sinking full control of the company that boasts 88 million users in Russia. That's more than Facebook. Let's join Tim now on the business desk, because last week you were up by about 120% in positive territory. That's amazing. Yeah, so what's going and, on now? Uh, more amazing than that is the hot streak continues. We got Yandex, which people often compare to Google, uh, the Russian equivalent, and they went up by $1,300. So we're at over $23,000, starting from the original $10,000 investment. Wow. I, I, yeah, I don't even know what to say. That's uh, incredible. They did want me to mention, though, that they trade, I believe, on the NASDAQ and not mm -hmm. on the Russian market. So they're uh, actually very successful. In fact, uh, Russian people have a strong preference for their own homegrown uh, web things. Like mm -hmm. we have Facebook and Google, but Yandex and Kontaktia, the Facebook equivalent, uh, tend to do very well against them in Russia and are still uh, number one. So I'm actually a bit of a fan of Yandex. They have a lot of things to offer, just like Google. They have, you know, maps and uh, email and all that. But they have mm -hmm. some unique things like their own market where you can uh, shop for things, especially telephone. Uh, and they have even Yandex Money, which is kind of like PayPal, which is cool. cool. So, very interesting company. But let's see yep. what I'm going to invest in next week. Go for it. Yeah. Will the, will the streak continue? Well, let's, yes. uh, let's, let's. When see. will it end? Is more the question. Yeah, or that. Yes. When will it end? Horribly, horribly end. Ooh, oh, Gazprom. Gazprom. Okay. Mega, mega gas giant Gazprom, which I believe we've had before, but is more important for me as the financiers of my favorite soccer team in Russia. <laughs> so maybe I can buy a Gazprom jersey for next week. But anyways, we'll see how they perform uh, next week, and uh, I. I'm not really sure what the results will be. Yeah, well, I'm sure they'll be positive because we seem to have a bit of a, a trend going on right here. I'm surprised yeah, no one's kind of broken into the RT headquarters and stolen oh, that will to, to steal for their the own will. Yeah, to be honest, uh, yeah. I mean, if you could guarantee someone a 120% return on their money, this thing would it's be pretty gone. Awesome. It's like that uh, octopus that predicts uh, soccer games in other countries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's just as bizarre. All right, yeah. Tim and your magic wheel, thanks so much. Good luck next week with Gazprom. It's constantly in the spotlight at the moment, as you know, so. All right. Take care, Katie. Gazprom it is. Will he be up? Probably. OK, that's it for today. Thank you so much indeed for joining me. I do appreciate it. And join me next week. I will be on Twitter and Instagram in the meantime. So see you there. Goodbye.